your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Now, we were going to record this episode a couple weeks ago uh, with my good colleague and friend, uh, Paul Avalar, who's joining me again today. But we ran into some technical difficulties, and then I fled the country for a couple weeks. Um, but I'm back. Uh, I'm not in trouble with the law. And um, we, 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 saw, we saw a little bit of Scotland, which I can tell you is still very Scottish, uh, still very green, and um, the cows are still very hairy, as well as the sheep. Um, but now I'm back, and so we're going to try this again, and I think it's going to work this time, um, although we may be a little bit, bit rusty about that. Well, I might be rusty. Paul will not. So, Paul, welcome to Short Circuit. Thanks for having me back, and it's good to see you again. You tanned and rested. Well, not tanned in Scotland, but yeah, there was there wasn't a lot of the t- first. They're in London for a little bit when the, during the heat wave, and it was very hot. But uh, yeah, Scotland. I'm in that- Arizona. You're not going to give me. I, okay. I don't want to hear about a heat wave. We we, we won't go there. <laughs> the British thought it was a heat wave. Um, <laughs> for for what that's worth. Uh, so. Um, we're going to talk today uh, a few six things going on in the Sixth Circuit, uh, especially to do with property rights. Um, first, though, I just want to announce uh, again that we have a few Short Circuit Lives coming up. And the one that I'm most excited to talk about is our Short Circuit Live for the general public that will be on Wednesday, October 26th in New York City. So if you are anywhere close to New York City and you would like to see a live recording of Short Circuit, um, you can RSVP. We have a link in the show notes that you can click on. Um, My colleague Anya Bidwell will be hosting that show. We're going to have Professor Alex Reinert, who's been on Short Circuit before, um, of the Cardozo School of Law, Professor Bruce Green of Fordham, and uh, Maureen Shaw of Quinn Emanuel, Um, to talk about the Second Circuit and the goings-on in the Second Circuit, a few uh, recent cases of what it's like to clerk there, all that fun Short Circuit Live stuff. Uh, If you live in the New York City area, we'd love to see you. But today, we have um, our Arizonan here, Paul Avalar, to talk about what's going on in the uh, Eastern Midwest, the the Sixth Circuit. First, we're going to talk about a property rights case. Then I'm going to discuss a um, an intervention case from Michigan about wineries. Always a fun topic. And then we're going to close with some goings on in the city of Nashville. So, Paul, uh, take it away. Um, are you uh, first? I, I should start it this way with this case. Are you in favor of historic preservation? And what's wrong with you if you are not? <laughs> So I am in in favor of historic preservation, but there are good ways of doing it and bad ways of doing that. And uh, this one seems to me to be a bad way. Uh, So the first case we have is Stevens versus City of Columbus. Andrew Stevens, Melanie Copperhaver, they owned a home in the Bryden Road Historic District of of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, And in 2018, they landscaped their front yard. And here is where their troubles began. (laughs) Uh, you see, the, their home was subject to something called the Columbus Historic Planning and Preservation Code. Uh, and therefore, they had to apply to something called the Historic Resources Commission for permission, uh, known in the code as a Certificate of Appropriateness, to make most renovations and improvements to their property. And just by way of background, the Historic Planning and Preservation Code has four stated goals to preserve and promote the public health, safety, and welfare by means of regulation and restrictions enacted to encourage the orderly growth and development of the city, to provide for adequate light, air, open space, and convenience of access, to protect against fire and natural hazards, and to maintain and enhance the value of buildings, structures, and land throughout the city. Kumbaya. The problem is that Stevens and Copperhaver didn't seek permission before their landscaping. And so they visited upon their neighborhood the horror of, quote, several retaining walls, dark mulch, and new plants to the front yard of the property. The horror. 
through the miracle of Google Roadview, I've, I've looked at the neighborhood uh, and I think it looks good compared to the sort of plain, short, grassy slope found in much, but not all, of the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and in fact, if you look at Google Street View, their neighbor has a very similar looking retaining wall terrace set up in the front of, of their yard. Uh, so this horror resulted in an order from the city to correct the violation by demolishing all of the landscaping that they just put in within 30 days or face a third degree misdemeanor that could result in a $500 fine and, a, and 60 days uh, imprisonment. And so they went to the commission who refused to give after the fact approval for the changes because the landscaping was not in character with the neighborhood or the house as it was too suburban. Their words, not mine. Uh, and the, com the commissioner spe specifically explained that the, the front lawn was not in keeping with what Brighton Road was about originally, with the continuous view down the street and park-like setting with continuous green lawn. Again, <laughs> their neighbors never... have the exact same setup uh, as they do. Well, and parks, you know, are always just green lawns. There's never anything else in a park. Like. Exactly. And, and what they really mean by a green lawn is like a strip of grass sort of on a nice incline about 15, 20 feet to the front door by the road. Like this is – they've not like remade the Garden of Versailles here. This is pretty simple stuff. And so ultimately the commission determined the landscaping was not compatible with similar improvements, the structure, adjacent properties, and the overall environment in effect – Again, their words, destroyed the distinguishing characteristics of the property and removed or altered historical material or distinctive architectural features. All they did was landscape their front yard. This federal suit followed, Stevens and Copperhaver bringing vagueness and non-delegation claims under the 14th Amendment, due process, and Article I of the Ohio Constitution as a fellow state constitutionalist. I, I know you'll be excited to hear that. Uh, they also brought an excessive fines claim under the Federal Eighth Amendment, uh, and spoiler alert, they they lost on all of them. Uh, and rather than talk about the specific claims, I want to talk about the way in which the court analyzed the vagueness and equal uh, equal treatment claims, the equal treatment under the Ohio Constitution. On vagueness, the court said, "Well, really, there's two parts of this of the statute here. Uh, first, it's very clear that you need permission to do almost anything on your property." And so you can't challenge like the vagueness of having to get permission to, to do anything. Um, and that's important because doing something per without permission is a crime. And so courts require a high level of definiteness. But here that's met by a requirement that very clearly says, if you want to do anything, get our permission first. The second part of the code standards for determining whether to issue a certificate of appropriateness. And, and here the court says much less definiteness is required because this is, this is merely a civil requirement. It's not criminal. It just controls what you can do with your own property. And so the burden is on the plaintiff, which they cannot meet here because, well, the, the code requires you to put in a bunch of information before the commission to get permission. So they must be, you know, that information must be used by the commission to make decisions. And so even though lots of other homes in this historic district have retaining walls and similar plant life and all the rest, well, that isn't enough. Like you have to go above and beyond. And of course, that requirement then flows right into the equal treatment claims, the arbitrary and unequal treatment uh, as the as it put as it's put under the Ohio Constitution. And yes, the Ohio Constitution provides strong property, uh, strong protections to private property rights, but it also says those rights are you know, subservient to the public welfare, and it means, therefore, that you get something like federal rational basis. You get a presumption of constitutionality. You get the burden on the plaintiffs to show that the law is clearly arbitrary and unreasonable, um, and beyond fair debate, et cetera, et cetera. So you have and strong look, protections, except they're not very strong. Except for they're not very strong. You have strong protections, except for they're presumed to be, everything's presumed to be perfectly fine. Well, look, there's no health or safety issue here. And, and, and nor is it the case that 
morals are involved, so far as I can see. But the court says historic preservation is part of general welfare, and that means aesthetics. And that means that, and, and the code says it's doing aesthetic, so we're fine. That's good enough for government work. And so just so everyone knows, now in the Sixth Circuit, the general welfare is implicated by the non-dangerous plants and walls you have in your front yard. And this really, I think, goes to something that you've had a couple of discussions about recently, the, really the expansion of land use law in cities to, to micromanage all sorts of things that really aren't health and safety issues like aesthetics here. Uh, and, and this is just, you know, another further example of how that goes and how, you know, quote unquote, strong protections for property rights really don't mean any protections for for property rights. Yeah. And it's 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 that it's not even aesthetics like you're trying to preserve, you know, a specific old, beautiful building, which I think is what most people think when they think about historic preservation laws, which itself is all kinds of problems, those, those types of historic preservation laws. But it it's, it's, makes more sense if, if that's the goal. But here it's, as you say, just this kind of ambiance of a lawn that at one time was fashionable when, you know, the street, I, I'm, I'm guessing, organically originally grew up. And then most of the neighbors had this type of lawn and they thought, well, you know, we're going to freeze that in place for all time because... Uh, is fashionable today, yeah, um, which the, is <laughs> which is what a lot, a lot of these, as we discussed with uh, with Nolan Gray in our in our last podcast, is is often what this really comes down to. Exactly. I mean, this really couldn't be any more aesthetics based if you if you tried to make it. The home, it's there's no allegations that they've done anything to the home. The home is 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 actually in great shape according to to Google Maps. But the problem is their lawn looks different. Again the horror and and where the public interest is in in micromanaging your lawn i'm i'm just hard pressed to see another interesting thing about this case was there's no um you read through it and usually a case like this about um you know some construction that's done on a property and then you know, a permit isn't given or something like that it's usually a takings claim because as as many of our listeners will know, the, the one part of the Constitution, usually you have, well, not a, a great shot at, but at least more of a shot at when it comes to property rights is the takings clause um, and that there's there's been some great diminution in value. But I don't even know if, you know, that they didn't bring a takings claim. And I'm guessing probably because it it's not like this was about changing the value of their house. They just liked how it looked compared to what it looked before. And so... Maybe they they could have got some appraiser to say, well, it was a little. It's you know, it, on the market, it would be go for a little bit more now because we have these more modern, I don't know, landscaping. But um, they didn't bring it, and and that means they're left with these other claims that really didn't go uh, very far. Uh, kind of predictably, didn't go very far, unfortunately, um, uh, because of what they did. One that that could have some legs for them in the future, it seems, is their excessive fines claim which the court said wasn't right because they haven't actually been fined yet, although they've been threatened with uh, $100 a day going forward. So that could add thousands of dollars, right, And given the, 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 a certain set of events. Um, but the court said it, it isn't ripe yet. And we'll get to uh, some more about fines uh, when, when we talk about um, city of Nashville uh, in a little bit. But first, we're going to take a bit of a detour uh, through wine country. Now, this case, wineries of the Old Mission Peninsula Association versus Township of Peninsula, Michigan, um, is it, it the underlying dispute is really interesting. It's actually a little bit similar to a um, a case I did for the Institute for Justice a couple years ago in Minnesota about um, about wineries, which is a it, there's a few challenges to how the township is regulating its wineries. One of which is they have to use a certain percentage of their grapes from the area, not necessarily from someone's own winery, but just from the area to make their wine. Um, and that uh, is a very uh, big kind of flashing red light for most people who have taken first year constitutional law is a big problem under the dormant commerce clause. 
Uh, and in fact, recently there was a ruling by the district court in this case. This is this is before the Sixth Circuit on appeal on a on, on a procedural issue. But the the district court recently said that yeah, it looks like those parts of this ordinance are unconstitutional under the Dormant Commerce Clause. So that's the dispute going on: is that there's these wineries and um, the township has these laws that kind of don't make sense for how it makes its wine. However, there are other residents. In this township, it's a it's a, like a peninsula off of uh, mainland Michigan, where there's kind of a bottleneck to get there, and so there's a dispute between the wineries who like people coming um, to you know sample the wines and do tastings and all that, and the other residents of the peninsula who don't like all the darn traffic. So. Uh, as often happens in rural places like this, you get backups and delays of traffic. You get, you know, other problems that you get in tourist communities. And so um, the lawsuit by the wineries against the township uh, is of interest to these other residents who have tried to intervene in the case to defend this, at least partially, pretty plainly unconstitutional uh, ordinance. So the case on appeal, the actual opinion we're talking about today, is about this procedural mechanism of intervention. Now, intervention is something we've talked about many times on the podcast before. It was a big topic at the Supreme Court this term. There were two or three cases on intervention. Two with a third that got kicked. Right. And um, there were even uh, a few other cases that people thought the the court might take because this... um, Uh, Anyway, it has been a big issue in a lot of ways. And this case raised a few of those issues. But one I I especially want to look at is one that we deal at the Institute for Justice a lot when we intervene in cases, and that's the adequacy of representation. So what does that mean? Well, in a lawsuit, when, say, you know, Smith sues Jones you may, you may, uh, some some other person, um, you may want to get involved in Smith v. Jones, and so you intervene. You may intervene as a plaintiff. Usually, in these constitutional cases, you intervene as a um, as a separate defendant, and you say, "I have arguments that this law, say, is constitutional, or what the government is doing is okay, but I have a different interest and different arguments than what the government." Has and this this happens in our school cho- choice cases a lot, where we represent parents, say who are defending a school choice program that's been sued by someone else, say the teachers union against the state, and we say, look, the state has those arguments, but we have different ones, and we have a different reason for being in the lawsuit than the initial defendants do. Well, in this case, uh, usually this stuff doesn't make it all that high up on appeal. It gets resolved at the trial court level. But but in this case, they they fought. They were denied the ability to intervene. And that is actually appealable interlocutory, um, on an interlocutory basis, which means you can appeal during the course of the lawsuit. So this went up to the Sixth Circuit. And um, this, um, this group of uh, residents called Protect the Peninsula, that was the name of their nonprofit, they uh, argued that they met all the requirements that you need for intervention, which we don't have to go into today, but they met all those requirements and therefore they should be allowed to intervene. Um, they had a legal interest because uh, you know their their quality of life is impacted by this um, by what the wineries are doing. Um, and they have different interests than the government. Now, this is an unresolved issue at the Supreme Court. We have hoped that the Supreme Court would take this issue this term. And as, as Paul said, it didn't, but it, it very well may sometime soon. And that's what wh- how you judge adequacy of representation when the government's involved. Now, what adequacy of representation means is, are the, are the defendants involved in the lawsuit, are they doing a good enough job, their lawyers doing a good enough job, that you don't need someone else um, to come in, and they're protecting the interests of these other people. Now, whenever you, you get involved in a lawsuit and you're not the government, you are going to have different interests, right? The government has, it's the government, it's defending the law, uh, it has to think about uh, the, the 
the overall public fisc, overall public policy. Sometimes governments settle cases, right? E- even if perhaps in theory they they could win if they if they went to judgment or kept appealing. And so those are different interests than the individual interests of who's intervening. Here are these these residents who you know they they have a a more narrow, and I don't mean that pejorative sense. They have a more narrow interest than the government does. Um, now, the court, the Supreme Court, has said with uh, that this is to be construed very broadly in in the run of the mill case. So you have two private people, one private person's been sued already, and then someone else wants to get uh, in intervene in the case. That it's viewed very broadly, but. When the government is whatever, whether we're talking about a city or the state or federal government, when the government is the original defendant, some circuits have said that there is a presumption that everything's fine because they're the government after all. They're looking out for everybody's interests, even if by definition, uh, your interests are going to be a little different. And what the, the Sixth Circuit said here is it had to deal with some of its own case law that kind of went in the, the, the way that it, it's harder to get involved in a, in a lawsuit like this. But it said, look, um, we're not going to presume that the township has it, it has the interests of these residents um, covered because you know they, the, the township has to worry about things like money. And this is actually a suit for damages. And they might uh, they might settle just because you know the, the say the insurance protection runs out or what whatever it may be. Um, and so for that reason, um, there is there is less of a presumption that um, that they have um, that they are adequately representing the interests of the other side. And so the long and the short of it is these residents are allowed to intervene um, and the case go, goes back down uh, where they can now make their own arguments separately from uh, from what the township is making. Now, why this matters is that. There are all kinds of civil rights uh, cases where constitutional cases where people intervene on the same side of the government, but for very, very different reasons. And we have noticed a trend in recent years of courts starting to say, uh, lower courts starting to say, well, the, you know, the government has you covered. And so we're going to assume ag- ag- against intervention. This goes the other way. Um, and it kind of is another brick in the circuit split that I really, I really think the Supreme Court is going to have to address um, soon. It did have an opinion this year that wasn't on this issue, but a similar issue. And it had some very good pro-intervention rhetoric in it, I thought, that could be uh, traceable to, that could be applied here. And that the court did talk about these recent cases. So I think this is a good step towards... Um, civil rights litigants being able to be uh, involved in these cases where, uh, you know, otherwise the court might just assume the government has everyone's interests at heart, which we know it doesn't always. Uh, Paul, is that that your read? And uh, I think that's correct. And, and, you know, generally big fan of, of being able to intervene. My only specific note here is that, you know, the, the, essentially the right that the interveners asserted was, the government may not protect my nimbyism nearly enough, and I have a real interest in my nimbyism. I think that part of it is very unfortunate. Uh, but it does, I think, again, reflect on the conversation that we've been having here for a long time and that you had with with Nolan Gray uh, last time about the way in which some of these land use regulations are put into place and who maintains them and how they're maintained and, and all the rest of that stuff. So I think this is Aside from being a good step on on clarifying uh, intervention law, I think it's also an example, un- unfortunately, of of that dynamic at work. Yeah, no, that's certainly the dynamic underlying this. Um, and I'm not, you know, there there is there are worse and and even worse nimbyisms. Not in my backyard. Uh, I don't know the specifics of this one at all, but uh, it, it seems like that is that is. Uh, the dynamic that that's going on underneath. Now, another dynamic is what the heck the city of Nashville is doing with its property owners. So a good friend of uh, the Institute for Justice, Bradley Balco, 
few weeks ago, he had a couple pieces about the city of Nashville and its code enforcement policies. And a lot of you listeners may know that what we've discussed over the years about um, fines and fees abuse, about code enforcement abuse, where uh, the city, instead of using code enforcement, like we discussed earlier, for uh, real public and health and safety concerns, instead uses it to um, do devious things like uh, promote redevelopment uh, when it doesn't want to do straight up um, eminent domain uh, or other nefarious purposes. So Paul's going to talk a little bit about um, what Radley found in Nashville, but but that's because Paul has actually litigated a property rights case in Nashville and recently had a ruling in that case at the Tennessee Supreme Court. So um, take it away. What what is uh, uh, what is the latest on property rights in um, the uh, city of Nashville, Paul? Well, almost five years ago now, we sued the city of Nashville over its restrictions on home based businesses. Uh, Nashville had a very uh, a very strict rule uh, that said if you you could have a home based business, but you couldn't have customers to your home based business, uh, unless you were a, a certain kind of home based business, in which case you could have you know as many as twelve customers per day. Uh, and so we uh, we at, the, uh, at IJ along with our friends at the Beacon Center sued the city of Nashville over this restriction on behalf of of two home based business owners there in Nashville, uh, Pat Rayner uh, and and Liz Shaw. Liz is a, a record producer. He's got an incredible home recording studio, and in fact, not long before the city of Nashville shut his recording studio down for recording people there. An album that was mixed there at his home recording studio actually won a Grammy award, uh, and and uh, Pat uh, is a uh, elderly uh, widowed uh, hairdresser um, has been uh, licensed by the state of Tennessee for a long time. Opened a a licensed home salon, uh, had the state come out and inspect everything. Everything was fine. And then shortly thereafter, got a visit from Nashville codes inspectors who told her, "No, you're allowed to have a salon." You just can't have any people to your salon, <laughs> and so you have to shut it down. And so we've been suing uh, about that restriction for a very long time, and 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 throughout the litigation, uh, especially in the trial court, you know, the city's position was, well, look, no one's allowed to have a home-based business with clients because if home-based businesses could have clients – the streets would run, run red with blood. I, can you imagine the the parade of horribles? Oh, well, he said, "Well, no, we can't. What are they?" And then we went out and disproved that any of those things were actually true, at least in our our clients' cases. And oh, by the way, you know why isn't that the case with all these other uh, home based businesses that you do allow to have guests? Well, those guys are different. How? Well, they're 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 different kinds of businesses, but. How are their clients different? How you say that traffic is a problem, even though our clients don't cause it? How is traffic not a problem with them? It turns out that it that they're a worse problem, in fact, than the kinds of home based businesses they they prohibited. And so we we litigated that we lost at the trial court in, in a decision that essentially said, well, Nashville has rationally assumed assumed that this could be a problem and therefore that's good enough and I'm not in the business of looking at your long list of, of facts and uh, admissions that, that say otherwise. Uh, and we took that up on appeal. And while we're up on appeal, this little thing called COVID started happening. And <laughs> Nashville ordered everyone to stop going to work and to work from their homes. Oh, wait. Mm, that sounds a little bit like a home-based business. There, there's a problem with that. And so – Nashville scrambled and changed its home-based business laws and allowed home-based businesses now to have six clients per day, certain exceptions uh, applying. But the privileged home ones, home-based businesses were still allowed to have more. We continue to fight about this. The, the Court of Appeals said that we were somehow moot, even though it was a temporary fix. The whole program was going to sunset. And also it continued to treat our clients uh, worse uh, than the privileged home-based businesses. And so we asked the Tennessee Supreme Court uh, to take that case, and we argued that back in January. And then in February, the city changed the program again and, and at least made the, the client uh, 
permission, you know, uh, indefinite, permanent. Um, nothing's permanent when it comes to the government. But it wasn't going to sunset anytime soon. That's good. But it continued to treat our clients worse than the privileged home-based businesses. And so last week, we got a ruling from the Tennessee Supreme Court that says, well, actually, there could continue to be a problem here. Um, because, you know, I know lawyers are bad at math, but six isn't 12. Uh, and they're different, in fact. Uh, and so we're going to send you back to the trial court so that you can have for the first chance in this litigation, since since, since changed after our record was closed, a chance to show that your clients are still harmed uh, by this regulation, which allows them six clients per day, but not the 12 that they originally sought. So that's good. It means that we're going to uh, continue to to litigate another day, and, and every day that you're suing the government is a good day, as far as I'm concerned. And so we'll go from there. Uh, as I said, you know, six isn't 12, and so Nashville's still treating our clients worse than they are other home-based businesses, and from where we stand for no good reason that has anything to do with the very lengthy record that we put together. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go forward from that. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that came out during our litigation, at our, and, and I think is or mirrored in some of Radley's uh, reporting here is, is the way that code enforcement actually works in Nashville, which is everything's anonymous. Uh, the city has no idea who's complaining about anything or why, or even if those things are legitimate. And so Nashville's own code inspectors actually said like, in depositions, oh, 40, 70 percent of these things are total nonsense. Uh, it's just one neighbor complaining about another because you know, they've they've had a fight about something else. And, and so they're sicking code enforcement on them. And that, you know, that that unfortunately sounds right. And so what it what you really have in these situations is when you have a very expansive code that has a lot of sort of eye of the beholder kind of violations, it really does make for a situation in which uh, a person can get in trouble for minor things that maybe aren't even code violations while someone else, you know, gets to do all sorts of things so long as no one complains. It's, it's a really, I think, unfortunate system uh, that Nashville and so many other cities maintain. And again, uh, you know, if this were the sort of thing where there were actually demonstrable problems uh, at the heart of things, I, I might feel differently about it. But when the city of Nashville, you know, treats home-based businesses differently based for, for no good reason, uh, it's, it's hard to sort of justify that, that whole system. It really is a system that is ripe for abuse, not just from, from city inspectors, but also from the general public. Yeah, and I, I highly recommend um, Radley's piece to, to those of you who haven't read it. And we'll put a link up it in the show notes. Um, he talks about his own experience, he and his wife's own experience and their property. Um, and basically they had the wrong type of weeds in their yard. If they had these different <laughs> weeds, they would have been okay. But because they had these other weeds, they had to, uh, get rid of them and make their yard actually worse, um, without some very expensive la landscaping back to landscaping. Um, but it, it seemed like when when really drilled down where this came where this complaint came from, it was from it seems like it was the head of a neighboring HOA who was bothered by the sight of these weeds, I guess, because, you know, if you're going to be the head of an HOA association, you're probably the type of person <laughs> who will be bothered by a certain type of weed. <laughs> um, and you're also the type of person uh, not, uh, I'm sure we have some HOA board member listeners so uh no no uh, not painting a broad brush on all HOAs but um I'm if you're you're also maybe the type of person if you're going to do that to complain about someone having a home based business down the street that's not hurting ever, anybody um but you just don't like you know bringing other people into the neighborhood perhaps or you don't like uh an extra 3 cars a day of traffic or whatever the case may be people get of course, very protective about their neighborhoods when they're um, when these types of laws uh, allow them to engage in this NIMBY behavior um, and to stop uh, neighborhoods from growing and um, and trying to uh, adapt to the times and and all the things that again that we talked about in our last podcast about what, what zoning but other laws too 
um, when that that restrict property rights uh, force people um, to uh, to to keep their property the same and not adapt to you know however the world changes. Yeah, we've we've talked about this some uh, on a couple of different occasions. Uh, you and I at least have, where it, we call it zoning, but it's really—I mean—we really ought to be calling it land use because this isn't, in so many cases, this isn't really a separation of this from that. It's you're drawing these incredibly fine gradations where there's really very, there's really no difference between you know what's perfectly normal and what's and what's forbidden there's been you know some of the sort of higher profile cases we've seen there was a a great one a couple of years and by great i mean horrible <laughs> a great one a couple of years ago where a, a woman had a, an online etsy store uh, where she sold dresses and she got in trouble for storing the dresses that she sold in her own apartment well where else do you store dresses it's it's called a closet um, so you could have a closet full of your own dresses, but if you had a closet full of dresses that you were going to sell, yeah. that was illegal. Uh, and you see, you know, other kinds of things when it comes to, oh, you can, you can have that kind of residential use of your property, but that other kind of residential use of, of your property is, is forbidden. Well, why? Well, because we say it is now go now go prove that we're not allowed to do it. Um, it's, it's. You know, we're we're looking at a number. We're doing a number of cases nationwide right now, having to do with land use regulations that have really made uh, uh, housing, I think, uh, prohibitively expensive, or try to make housing prohibitively expensive. That try and keep, I think, poor people out of out of neighborhoods or even out of uh, entire towns or cities. So at some point, we're going to have to start rethinking this idea that somehow property rights aren't real rights, but these other rights are real rights. But when property rights obviously, when an infringement of property rights obviously leads to these other sorts of problems, and how do you really make those distinctions? I, I just don't think that there's, you can possibly continue to, to, to hold that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think everything we've talked about today just comes down to that, that judicial engagement with property rights can be a tool. It's not. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it can be a tool to 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 fight against these um, abuses. Whether it's um, fines and fees for having the wrong weeds in your yard, uh, or um, or for um, for having a retaining wall that uh, you know some somebody somewhere thinks isn't uh, historically accurate. Dark dark mulch. Don't forget the horror yeah, of dark right, mulch. Yeah, right, right, dark mulch. I like the light mulch myself a <laughs> little better, but uh, that's that's aesthetics again. Uh, well, Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Always fun uh, when you're on the podcast, and uh, we'll have you on again sometime to talk. Maybe we will talk. We'll actually talk about something in Arizona. Um, one of one, one of these podcasts. Uh, thanks all of you for listening, and we'll be on again uh, with more episodes coming up, including all our live episodes coming up at various law schools this fall and at the one uh, Short Circuit Live in New York City on October 26th. But for in the meantime, for everyone else, I ask that you get engaged. Mm -hmm.